let's start this up. <clears throat> okay, um, so a couple of things uh, before we get started. Um, so <clears throat> today we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, continue with um, partial differential equations, kind of solve that, and then get into uh, Green's functions. Um, we'll see uh, where we get. May uh, It may be necessary to move some things around, and that's fine. I kind of built that into the schedule. Uh, but I do want to finish uh, the PDE section and um, kind of answer some of your questions from last week. Uh, that's also within my having in mind that uh, you have your next exam on Friday, your, ne your next homework due tomorrow. Um, so again, the exam is going to be a lot like the last time uh, you have a, a sample exam. We'll actually go over a problem that's very much like uh, one of the sample questions today. Um, <clears throat> okay. So we're gonna jump right in. Uh, before I do that, um, and just to remind you where we were last time, we were looking at separation of variables for spherical coordinates. And before I get into spherical harmonics in an example, um, I do wanna make sure I answer everyone's question about uh, the constants. And so there's some general confusion, I think, and this is pretty typical of how do you know whether to make um, a constant negative or positive when you separate uh, the variables. And what it comes down to is context. Um, almost always when you're looking um, at a, the azimuthal coordinate, um, that will require a negative constant because you'll have a periodic boundary condition you're gonna be wrapping around. Almost always when you have something that extends to infinity, you're going to have a positive constant because you're going to have something that needs to be zero at one of those uh, places, but maybe not at the other. And we'll see an example of that. So, I mean, my best um, advice to you is that some of this is practice, but a lot of it is context. So, and, and that context comes from the boundary values and the, the boundary conditions or the initial conditions, if we're looking at time uh, dependent. Uh, uh, cases. Okay, so and and we'll see a couple of that, a couple of uh, examples of that today. So um, let's move ahead. Uh, where I left off last time uh, was um, we had separated out the spherical harmonics for the Laplacian, or, or the um, the r, the phi, and the theta terms, and I just wanted to touch on. <clears throat> the theta term, which I had mentioned previously, which is that um, in this separation, you can uh, show that theta is equal to what's called the associated Legendre polynomials. They're essentially the Legendre polynomials. You can define them by a generating function um, that I've written here on the Legendre polynomials. And you might remember um, you can you can generate these uh, functions um, for either using uh, a point thirty or there's another possibility of one over two to the l l factorial times one minus x squared m over two times d to the m plus l dx m plus l times x squared minus one to the L. Um, honestly, these things aren't especially worth remembering or memorizing because you can always look these up. Um, where, where you'll uh, generally run into these are things like, um, right? Uh, those are the first two Legendre, ordinary uh, Legendre polynomials, that is when m is equal to zero, you just have the Legendre polynomials that you saw in E and M. Okay. And then uh, they continue on. We kind of did a problem where uh, you could generate the even and odd 
um, uh, Legendre polynomials last week. Anyway, um, this is the part where when we look at separation of variables, we're going to start getting things that are not in closed form. Um, now, in order to properly use this, uh, we have to normalize this properly. All right, so you can orthonormalize these. And this is a bit overkill, but it's something that you would have seen um, either explicitly or implicitly in, say, um, either E and M or in quantum, right? Um, well, plus M times the associated Legendre polynomials. And Rx, you may recall, is cosine theta, where that theta is that angle from the z axis. That means that um, we can write the spherical harmonic or the component of the solution for the Laplacian that is oops, strictly angular as y super m sub l of theta and phi is equal to the uh, product of the theta term and the phi term, right? Um, and uh, that just ends up being, um, I'll just put in a constant, it'll be the normalization constant times p sub l super m of cosine theta. And if you look in your notes, you would have an e to the i m phi uh, from the phi term. So this is L one three three, um, and of course that would have to be normalized as well. Uh, so this is what, where you get the um, probability distributions, right? So if you think back to um, quantum, y zero zero is the azimuthally and uh, theta symmetric case, right? So the if you think about what that looks like, it's just a sphere, right? The surface at a, at a given r. Uh, y one one is if you do this solution that gives you properly normalized the square minus square root of three over eight pi sine theta e to the i phi, and that looks like kind of a dumbbell shape, right? Um, and y01 is root 3 over 4 pi times cosine theta. And that gives you kind of the orthogonal version of that, right? And if you just go through all of that with um, um, the different values of those associated uh, polynomials and uh, Legendre polynomials and the e to the i phi, you'll get all of those distribution shapes that, that you've seen either in 160 or in quantum and perhaps other places. Question is, how do we use this um, in maybe something that's not quite so esoteric? Okay, so um, oh, I've run out of room. I'm going to switch over here for my example. Um, so this is similar to, it may even be the same question. I just uh, wanted to do something um, that was pretty closed form. Um, let's basically use this to find the temperature uh, as a function of r and theta inside a sphere uh, with a surface uh, temperature given by t r theta is equal to 2 plus cosine theta. Okay, so this is uh, the heat equation. Right? And uh, what that requires us to do is, and since this is steady state, 
This requires us to basically solve for um, the Laplace equation. Okay. Um, so inside the sphere, and, and I'll get to this a little in a little more detail in just a second. We have those our choice. So a uh, couple of things. Let me back up. One is that this is um, azimuthally symmetric, so we don't have to worry about phi. And in fact, the Legendre, the associated Legendre polynomial collapses to just the Legendre polynomial. Okay. Our uh, radial solution, as we'll see in a minute, um, can either take the form of r to the l or r to the minus l. Uh, so inside, we know that r has to be r to the l so it doesn't blow up at the origin. Okay, so our solution for t as a function of r and theta has to be from our separation of variables, the combination of these two things. Okay, we're just taking those solutions and adding them back together. Well, we just saw that theta is the associated Legendre polynomial, but if it's azimuthally symmetric, then it's just the regular Legendre polynomial. And we've made the choice, and this is kind of the same thing as, as choosing whether that constant is negative or positive. We're inside the sphere, we can't have it blow up, so that the solution, the general solution to this, is going to be the linear combination of, say, and we'll have a combination constant, C sub L of R to the L times the Legendre polynomials. Okay, now this is fine. That is a general solution to this problem, but we're given boundary conditions, right? So we know that um, at r, at little r equals r, all of this, sine theta, has to equal two plus cosine theta, just from the start of the problem. And the reason why this is kind of a cool problem, and it's not different, it's, it's not different in quality from what we've done with Fourier series is that this is basically two times P sub zero for the Legendre polynomials. And this is just P sub one for the Legendre polynomials if the argument is cosine theta. That means that the series solution terminates naturally, right, at L equals one, if we're going from L equals zero to one. Um, so we know that C0, P0 is equal to 2 P0. That means that our first constant is equal to 2. And then for L equals 1, we have C1 times R times P1. This is, again, on the edge of the, of the sphere, and that equals P1. So that means, oh, this is C plus two. C1 has to be equal to one over R. Okay. So what that means is, and then all other C sub L's are equal to zero. This is another question that some people asked uh, about last week, especially when we were looking at um, the eigenfunction problems. One of the tricks to when we start solving these partial differential equations or even ordinary differential equations with series is can we make that terminate? In the case of the self-adjoint ODEs that we looked at, we were lo the eigenvalues were determined by what terminated the series away from a, a divergent point. Here we're lucky enough that the boundary conditions tell us that there are no more terms in the series. And so that allows us to write the final solution. Then since we know the, the coefficients, as um, two p naught of cosine theta, which is just going to be one, plus r over r, because it's the one uh, one term times p sub one of cosine theta. 
And that is our solution to the, the steady state equilibrium temperature inside a sphere in which the um, outer temperature of the sphere is held at this function two plus cosine of theta. Um, you could imagine doing this problem with any other kind of function on the outer sphere and you would just make the same arguments. Namely, this is going to be the general uh, solution and whether and how you terminate the solution, the series depends on what T of R theta is. Okay. And we'll see that you can do the same thing for a cylinder. Okay. It seem reasonable? There's a, there's a question like that on the sample. Okay. All right, let me make sure everyone's finished writing. Okay, let's scoot, up. Let's scoot over. All right, so now, um, let me make sure I have the right number here, 33. Now we're gonna quickly look at cylindrical uh, coordinates. And what I wanted, the reason why I wanted to do the example that I just did um, was to bring up this thing that you may have noticed, maybe not, doesn't matter. Um, if you haven't noticed it before, it's certainly something that um, we run into all the time. And that is when you um, separate out a Laplacian, whether you're looking at the a Laplace's equation or Helmholtz equation or the wave equation, you often run into these two equations. Uh, in the case of cylindrical coordinates, where here R might, will be, will take as rho, right? you'll have an R dr of R dr dr dr. <laughs> yes, right, is equal to n squared R, right? So we'll often see that. And in spherical coordinates, we've just seen, you have this d dr of R squared dr dr is equal to L plus L plus one times R. Okay, so we're gonna run into that a lot. Um, and we can look at uh, these special cases because the nice thing about these, um, at least for uh, the Laplace uh, equations, um, for n equals zero, right? Uh, if you look at uh, this equation, Uh, for n not equal to zero, you get the r to the n and r to the minus n case, and you can show that that's uh, true by substitution. Right? And um, if n is equal to zero, then you have uh, either a solution of log of r or constant. So again, you can plug those in and verify by substitution. And this is, again, stuff that you saw or is in chapter three of Griffiths. Uh, in the spherical case, as we just saw, you would have 8.35, right? And you can show, uh, in this case, it doesn't matter whether L is equal to zero or not. The uh, general solution for just the Laplace equation is, is R is equal to R to the L or R to the L minus one. And which you choose depends on the conditions of the problem. Generally speaking, you try not to choose the power of R that blows up, okay? So, um, I would, of the kinds of things that you need to memorize, those are very handy things to know off the top of your head, okay? And, and it's kind of, if you think about it, it's the kind of thing, it's the way, way it would go, right? It's a pow, R is a power law, and it's either a positive power law or a negative power law. There's an extra uh, factor of R in the spherical case, um, but otherwise, um, you know, the, the what, you can, of course, make much more complicated problems, but generally speaking, you're trying to solve some things where you're trying to avoid a singularity. Okay, so with that in mind, um, we can uh, look at the general solutions then for uh, uh, cylindrical coordinates. Uh, we'll start with uh, Laplace. So for Laplace's uh, equation, we have, of course, del squared psi is equal to zero. And that gives rise to, we'll say, um, capital P 
of rho. And I'll just write it in turn, I'll write it like this, which I did for some of the uh, solutions. This just means that this is a linear combination of rho to the m or rho to the minus m. Um, phi of phi, linear combination of cosine m phi sine m phi. And almost always, although not, not always, but generally speaking, we don't, we don't run into problems where we care about the z solution. But you can imagine that for most of these problems, the z solution takes on the other value of the constant. That is, z is an exponential. Right? But I'm going to leave that out for now. Um, when I, I'll come back to it when I rewrite the entire equation. Um, the, the Helmholtz equation then has, is different in that it has a constant, right? Um, and there, so these are the two, thing, two equations that you will generally run into. You'll have uh, P as a function of rho will be a linear combination of J sub M alpha of rho or alpha rho or N sub N alpha rho where these are the uh, Bessel and Neumann functions. That is, the J is the Bessel function and the N are the Neumann functions. And that's something we're going to talk about uh, next time and probably into next week. Um, that's just because we've thrown in another constant in there. Again, these things are going to be periodic or um, recurring but not periodic and finding where the zeros are is part of the game of, of using Bessel functions but it's again it's just a, a less familiar version of sines and cosines. Um, what you can then uh, do is the or write and I think this is part of one of your homeworks is uh, write uh, the general case so the general solution uh, why I did this, this is C and this is D, C and D. So the general case, you would have typically D squared Z DZ is equal to L squared capital Z. Uh, D squared phi, D squared phi, D phi squared is equal to minus M squared Phi. And rho d rho of rho dp d rho plus n squared rho squared minus m squared times p of rho is equal to zero. And what kind of problem you're dealing with depends on whether this is zero, this is zero, whether n is greater than m. If you look in your textbook, in fact, uh, it's early on in chapter nine, they have a table of uh, the different uh, cases for, in particular, that p of rho, given, uh, depending on what the values of n and m are. So uh, this comes, this derivation comes from separation. Using the cylindrical coordinate version of the Laplacian, which is essentially what we did um, with spherical coordinates last time. And remember what you could do with this. If you know what the Laplacian is, if you can just solve if this is equal to zero, you can solve for the potential, right? But you can also solve for the steady state temperature uh, in a region. Um, and then the other classes of partial differential equations, typically, the, which your book does cover things like the wave equation, things like that. 
All right. How are we doing? Good? Okay. Um, everybody got this? All right. I'm going to do, uh, because there was a little bit of confusion, some of that, a lot of it was my fault last time. I want to finish this section with another um, problem uh, and send you off to do it. Uh, in this case, what we're going to do is a steady state uh, problem, uh, but in two dimensions. Um, and we're going to be solving for the temperature. So here's the setup. Um, going to have basically what's called a, a semi-infinite strip. So, so imagine that this is your x-axis, this is your y-axis, and in fact, I'm going to let the y-axis go to infinity. Right, so this is y, this is x. We're going to uh, set the barrier. We basically got this strip goes from x equals 0 to x equals 10. Right. And um, we're going to hold the temperature down here at, oops, at 100 degrees. So it's a little bit similar to what we did last time. But the temperature here is zero. The temperature here is zero. And the temperature is zero at y equals infinity or y goes to infinity. All right, so our conditions are, or the problem is, let me start with the problem. What is the <clears throat> steady state temperature um, in the strip for these boundary conditions? That is uh, T of x of x equals zero. equals 0, t of x equals 10 is equal to 0, t of y equals 0 is equal to 100, and t of y goes to infinity is equal to 0. Okay. So what I want you to do when I send you to your breakout rooms is use Laplace's equation to find T means you're going to need to separate T into functions of X and Y and choose the, the constants appropriately. Uh, what you're going to find, what I'm looking for you to write, at least in, in the 10 minutes that I'm going to set, set aside for this, is just what is the linear combination solution, right? And then we can when we come back, we'll look at how we can look at this. If you want to go ahead and go that far, please do. How we can write this as a FOIA series, which is something that I, that I mentioned last time. All right, everybody clear on what you're supposed to be doing here? Thumbs up if you are. All right. Um, let's do this then. Uh, oh, I'll put you both together this time. Okay, here you go.
You guys work it out, okay? So we've seen the, a green message from you, but we couldn't read it, and we mm -hmm. thought maybe you were asking us to go back. Uh, I said two minutes. It didn't say anything. Okay, okay because we, we just didn't see the message itself, because oh, okay. it popped up and disappeared. Really? Okay. All right. Sorry. <clears throat> Okay, welcome back. How'd you guys do? Eh? Okay. What's the the functional form for y? Just general. Exponential. Yeah, positive exponential. And the general form for x? Sine of total. Mm -hmm. uh, which one, sine or cosine? Sine. Right. Um, good. So, um, what we have then is uh, d squared t is equal to zero. And so that means when we do the separation, we have uh, x double prime over x is equal to some constant that we'll say is negative. And the reason for that, again, is the initial conditions. We want it to be zero on both ends. Um, that means that uh, y double prime over y is going to be equal to k squared. Okay, so that means that uh, our solution for x is going to be a linear combination of um, cosine uh, kx and sine kx. And our linear solution for y, our linear combination, is going to be e to the minus kx and e to the kx. Right. Um, and from these, we know that the uh, boundary conditions uh, tell us that um, uh, the cosine term goes away. So if we were to put um, a, term, or a consonant, we'd set it equal to zero. Um, and also we know that um, the, uh, let's see, what do we have here? The positive, oh, sorry, I, I must have misspoke, misspoke. Um, no e to the kx term because that blows up at y equals infinity. Um, we also know from the boundary conditions if it has to be equal to zero uh, uh, at l equals, or x equals 10, that k is going to be equal to n pi over 10. All right, so some of the same things that we've done with um, Fourier series. So we have that our solution t is equal to uh, a sum of linear combination of some constants we'll call suggestively b sub n times e to the minus n pi y over 10 uh, times sine of n pi x over 10. Okay. And that, again, is a perfectly acceptable general solution. We have more information, though, right? At y, 
equals zero, we know that T is equal to 100. Moreover, this starts to look like a Fourier expansion of uh, a function. Uh, namely, uh, what we, if we recognize that this B sub n is our Fourier uh, B sub n, we can write B sub n is equal to two over L, just in general from zero to L of F of X sine of n pi x over l dx, right? Where in this case, l is equal to 10 and f of x is equal to 100. And if you substitute those values in, you'll find that b sub n is equal to, I did this right, 400 over n pi for uh, n odd and zero for n even. So your general solution, the way that you can get this obviously is that when uh, y is equal to zero, the exponential term is gone and you just have b sub n times sine of n pi x over 10 is equal to 100 and you're just finding that Fourier expansion, right? So then the general solution would include our b sub n's, okay? So that's how you use Laplace's equation in separate, this was, in this case, this was Cartesian coordinates. In the other example, it was or spherical coordinates and we were able to make use of the Legendre polynomials. If we were to do cylindrical coordinates, we might have to worry about Bessel equations, right? Depending on what the um, function is at the boundary. Um, any questions on this? Did everybody see why? Give me a thumbs up if you understood why the x, the constant for the x equation had to be negative. Yeah? Because we know that on both sides it had to be zero. So we need something that is periodic, right? In the y solution, we knew uh, one side was non-zero, but the other side had to go to zero. That, mean not only, that meant that not only that the constant had to be uh, positive, for the, y, the separation of y in that solution, but that it had to go to zero at infinity, which is why we could knock out one of those solutions. Okay. So the way that I could trick this up, just as I could trick up the uh, example, and I would suggest you look at it, is changing the f of x or changing l, right? And same thing with the uh, temperature uh, distribution inside a sphere. What if it wasn't two plus cosine theta? What if it was just cosine theta? Okay. Then one of those uh, Legendre polynomials would drop away. You'd have just the P1 solution and all of the other constants would go away. So there are kind of easy things that you can do as you prepare for the exam to see if you get the gist of what the, what's behind these PDEs. Make sense? Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Well, just enough time to start something really confusing. And that's uh, Green's functions. Now, um, I had this on the reading and we're going to, we're obviously going to be a bit behind on the schedule and that's fine. Um, but what is the value of Green's functions? What does it allow us to do more than anything else? So far, most of the partial differential equations have been what kind of partial differential equations? Almost all of them, in fact, in the last couple of days. Separable. Well, separable, sure, but what else? We've looked at Laplace. What haven't we looked at? Poisson. Right, Poisson equation, right? So. Um, Green's functions are a way of, of essentially uh, solving these inhomogeneous uh, partial differential equations. And in particular, 
um, uh, Green's functions are a way of solving Poisson's equation. Which you remember, I mean, Laplace's equation is really useful in, say, E and M or in gravity, right? In the absence of charge, right? But sometimes you are going to have charge, right? Um, so um, let's just remember that Poisson's equation, um, del squared psi is equal to minus rho naught over, say, epsilon naught if we're going to use the uh, E and M uh, version of this. And what we can imagine then is we'll look at some point charges and then distributed charges. We have a point of interest P. Um, we have a charge Q2 at R2. Um, we have R and let's see, this is R one, P one, and uh, R. Um, for point charges, this is just basic, right? Psi is equal to one over four pi epsilon naught times the sum of Q sub i over R sub i. If we um, want to look at a, distrib a distribution of charge, which is where this becomes uh, really important, right? So we say we have some distribution of charge and we have some elemental area, d tau two. Um, we can identify R two this way. Um, we can have a charge Q one up here. This is R one. Um, Am I doing this right? No, it's all right. I thought that was wrong. Sorry, sorry. This is R1 and this is R, right? Which is equal to R1 minus R2, right? So we're trying to locate our point of it, our test charge with respect to uh, the distri distribution of charges, right? If we were to write psi then, what, is that, what does A.2 become? An integral. Right, so and in particular it becomes an integral over that distribution. In general we would write it as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, right, um, times the integral of rho of r over r d tau. In this specific case what we want is what is psi at r1, and so that's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the integral of the charge distribution at R2 over R1 minus R2 d tau 2. All right, that's the general uh, problem that we face in E and M with a charge distribution, right? So what we're going to do is um, let uh, del squared g, some general function that we haven't defined yet, and we'll actually take different forms for different um, partial differential equations and different geometries, be equal to minus the um, delta function of r1 minus r2. Um, basically, what we're looking at is the potential at R1 um, due to a source at R2. And we're going to use um, Green's theorem.
Uh, anybody remember what the general case, what does Green's theorem get us? What is, where are we going from and toward with Green, when we use Green's theorem? Volume integral and surface integral. Yes, so we are taking basically the divergence of something uh, inside a volume interval and equating it with uh, the dot product of that function with the surface interval, right? With the and doing the integral. And then our idea, right, generally speaking, is to let that surface go to infinity so we can make terms drop away, right? That was the kind of the whole thing when we came up with Gauss's law and all this kind of stuff in, in Griffiths. So what we're gonna do then is look at the interval over the volume of psi times del squared g minus g del squared psi d tau. We're doing this because of how we've defined the green, this function g, um, and also because we kind of know where we're going uh, with the answer. But we're su suppose you can uh, create, consider this uh, volume. Uh, interval. By using Green's uh, function or Green's theorem, we can transform that into the surface interval of psi times the gradient of g minus g times the gradient of psi dot d uh, sigma. And then uh, if we make s go to zero, that is the integrand goes to r to minus two, this is the typical um, manipulation that we have for uh, these surface integrals. We have ultimately that the uh, integral around over v psi del squared g d tau two is equal to the integral over that volume of g del squared psi over that, again, over that volume. That's just because we're able to drop out that term and then equate everything in that integrand. Okay. Um, and I know we're running out of time. What we now do is we substitute in what our green, what our function was, this delta function, right, which allows us to rewrite these uh, equations rather simply, right? Once you have a delta function inside that interval, it that function becomes the value at that, uh, at that point. And the result is that psi at R1 is equal to one over epsilon naught times G, we'll say at R1 and R2 times rho over uh, R2, or as a function of R2 times d tau 2. And we're running out of time, so I'm going to stop it here. But the development that we're doing is that we're basically creating a way to solve Poisson's equation, an inhomogeneous partial differential equation, by introducing a weighting function. And that's what our, our Green's function is. And if we know what the problem is, if we know what the differential operator is, in fact, if you go back to how I started writing uh, those second order ODEs as Ls, as operators, each operator has its own Green function. Um, and that Green function allows us to solve these inhomogeneous partial differential equations. All I've done so far is just set up um, how we're gonna drive this for uh, Laplace or Poisson's equation. We'll look at the other equations and the other forms that G, the specific forms that G takes. You can kind of see that in 8.8, .8, G is going to have to take the form of one over four pi times one over R minus R, right? That will become the basic Green's function for a Laplace equation. But there are others, and then we'll see how we can use that to solve things like the uh, electric potential off axis from a ring of charge, right? Something that ordinarily we can't do or couldn't do in E and M uh, in Griffiths, but using something like Green's function treatment, we'll be able to do. 
So um, I know I've gone over, I apologize. Um, make sure you look over the uh, homework. Uh, it's not that, the, the assignment itself is not that long, um, but it will be good practice for uh, the exam. And then I really try and aim for getting that in by five tomorrow. I do have office hours today and tomorrow. Um, because I want you to be able to have some time to study for the exam. And I'll probably add some extra office hours on Thursday if you want to talk about uh, those practice problems. Okay. Any questions before we go? All right, well then I will see you later. Thanks guys, I hope you're doing okay. Bye. Thank I'm you.